Hi, I'm John O. Freeman, and welcome to Just Saying. The brilliant Simon Miles had the right idea when he said that everyone got their own personal Shakespeare. That's right. So it's important. Got their own personal Shakespeare. Yeah. So getting back to the thing, uh, what we want to got their own personal. Shakespeare. We get it. Everyone, Shakespeare is different. We all have our own. Per <laughs> we don't like our version of Shakespeare being messed with. But is there any basis for proposing an alternative to Shakespeare of Stratford as a writer for the works? What about Sir Francis Bacon, for example? What about simply exploring the link between Bacon and Shakespeare? Another great man, Lawrence Gerald, SirBacon.org, once made me aware of the dangers in claiming to be an expert in any field and in declaring something to be fact. So, unlike the Stratfordians and their religious dogma of ownership, we'd simply like to state a strong opinion based on the evidence. Because as well as being part of the field of literature, this is also a matter of history about getting it right. To prepare a quick meditation session. Breathe in and take yourself back in time, a time before the 18th century when David Garrick birthed the myth of Shakespeare as a way to make a buck and to stroke his enormous actor ego. Breathe in, funny how nothing changes and breathe out. I'd like to briefly examine three curiosities, three undercredited pieces of evidence, three more meaningful coincidences to add to the pile, which, just saying, may show a connection between Bacon and Shakespeare. To do this, we will need to dip into a work which Mark Rylance has even called the Shakespeare Bible, titled The Bacon Shakespeare Question by Nigel Coburn. We prefer to pronounce the name as it is spelled. Coburn! Because it metaphorically conjures the outcome his wonderful book may potentially unleash on the Stratfordian argument. Coburn! We hope you'll find it interesting to compare these findings with some of the evidence supplied by the Stratfordians. For example, Hand D or hand do, as I like to call it. Who'd have a hand do job when you can have a home run swing? Are you mankind? <laughs> Just saying. Category one, hard hitting. Bacon left a writer's notebook of loose sheets, which has been called the promus, Latin for storehouse. In it, Bacon jotted down thoughts and phrases which might be of use to him. These included metaphors, similes, aphorisms, apothegms, turns of speech, proverbs. Many in French, Spanish and Italian. Rep repartee, forms of compliment and single words. Both Bacon and Shakespeare had supple, inventive minds, and when they garnered an idea of interest, it was fashioned into a different form. Here, we may find seeds that fully flower in the plays. In one entry, Bacon muses about his intention to spend a law term at his Twickenham Lodge, writing merry tales or comedy plays. The Stratfordians dismissed this evidence out of hand, not making any exhaustive search for promus parallels. I mean, who can be asked? Oh, Mrs. Henry Pot could. The stalwart who devoted countless hours to this research. A parallelism is a correspondence between passages in the works of two authors. It may be a thought which is shared or the language or both. In ascertaining the weight of parallels between Bacon's promus and Shakespeare, Cockburn! 
estimates somewhere in the region of 600 cases. He explores a number of what he calls explanatory details. And having consulted Bacon to understand Shakespeare, he says it's not unreasonable to suspect common authorship. Turns out the Shakespeare works are suffused and saturated in Bacon's thought and expression. Let's have a look at some fun, wee examples between Bacon's primary centuries and a line from Shakespeare. All is not gold that glisters. All is not gold that glisters. Thought is free. Thought is free. All's well that ends well. All's well that ends well. Just saying. Category two, compelling. In 1867, a fire damaged bundle of manuscripts in late Elizabethan script was found in Northumberland House, The Strand. That this Northumberland manuscript was once in Bacon's ownership and possession is acknowledged. On the top cover is an inventory of contents and the manuscripts listed seem to belong to roughly 1595 to 1596. Probably nearly all the writing was done by one or more of Bacon's scribes. This is the earliest known reference to a Shakespeare play in manuscript form. Two, in fact, Richard II and Richard III. The names of Bacon and Shakespeare encircle the Richard entries and Francis appears between them. All this suggests that the scribe associated the names with each other and with the plays. To the left of Richard II, it actually says by Mr. Francis Bacon who was only a mister at this time. If the scribe wrote Shakespeare's name near the Richard place before they were first published under that name in 1598, how did he know their authorship? Unless his master was Shakespeare. Towards the bottom of the cover is the name Shakespeare written 16 times. Evidently Scribbler had Shakespeare on the brain. Natural if Shakespeare was your master's pen name. Back to our hero, Simon Miles. He managed to identify two words on the manuscript that no one else has attempted to read. The scribe has turned the manuscript upside down and written in helling, which means undercover, over the name William Shakespeare, where it says Richard II, to indicate that it was a pen name. Just saying. Category three, curioso. Did you know the only known Elizabethan painting of a Shakespeare scene can be found in a tavern which borders the Bacon Estate in St Albans? In 1985, some panelling was removed from the walls of an annex in the White Hart Hotel. Underneath was found a mural of the final scene of Shakespeare's long poem, Venus and Adonis, from 1593, in which Adonis is gored to death by the boar. The mural has been dated at 1600 or slightly earlier. How comes it then that the only known contemporary painting of a Shakespeare work turns up in one of Bacon's locals? Cockburn! It makes perfect sense. If Venus and Adonis was known to have been written by a local man, a scion of the great family which had its country seat nearby, the boar scene would be particularly appropriate as a boar features on the Bacon's family crest. A building in the background of the mural also looks to represent old Gorhamberry House. Of course, the Stratfordians brushed the mural aside as mere coincidence. But would they have been so dismissive if it had been found at Stratford, close by to the Shuckspare home in Henley Street, or by New Place? Just saying. Let's finish with a little Nietzsche, who in 1880 wrote, If you don't know half enough about the Lord Bacon, what do I care about the miserable gabble of mudless and blockheads? The critics can go to hell. <laughs>